So we're starting with chapter 12. Now I have to warn you, okay, the way I've been explaining the book of Samuel until now, uh, little questions have arisen. And one of the questions that, that came up was um, this constant, what seems to be back and forth between Samuel that is resenting this idea of having a king and going along with it, uh, even talking positively about it. And it seems to go back and forth. We also have this, there were a couple of questions that we talked about, you know, Samuel actually anoints Saul uh, privately. And, and then he, he gathers the nation uh, together. And then at the end of chapter 11, we have the statement, let us go to Gilgal and renew uh, the monarchy, okay? And we know that uh, back in chapter 10, um, uh, there was already a procedure by which um, Samuel's announced, and it was even a procedure that involved, that involved a divine lottery, so to speak, to appoint Samuel. So we've already, to, excuse me, to appoint Saul. So we've already seen three different types of, of coronation, so to speak. We have this private anointing. We have something uh, that went on uh, in chapter 10 at the mitzvah. We have something that happens at the end of chapter 11 in the Gilgal. Uh, and it's we're going to have further questions that go up, particularly in chapter 13. Okay. So I just want to let you know that what we're doing today is we're continuing in chapter 12 to go through to see what happens. Okay. Trying to um, understand. The, according to the chronological order of these chapters, what is really happening and where there's slight problems trying to harmonize some of the issues. I will warn you, though, that when we get to chapter 13, everything's going to blow up. Okay, we're going to have to reevaluate everything, but I'm going to wait till then until we get to chapter 13 and 14, uh, and then we're going to make some new suggestions about how to read all of this stuff. But for now, we're just going in the traditional way, okay? So that's just kind of a little uh, uh, hedge in my bets kind of thing. Okay, so let's start with chapter 12. Again, we're right after chapter, at the end of chapter 11, they're in the Gilgal, okay? And they crowned Saul again, all right? Now, chapter 12, then Samuel said to all Israel, I have yielded to you in all you have asked of me and have set a king over you. Henceforth, the king will be your leader. Okay, sounds great. It sounds like a natural progression from what happened at the end of chapter 11. As for me, I have grown old and gray, but my sons are still with you and I've been your leader from my youth to this day. Here I am. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of his anointed one. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Or whom have I robbed? From whom have I taken a bribe to look the other way? I will return it to you. Okay. So here again, we are hearing echoes of what we heard way back in chapter eight um, when they first asked for a king. And let's take a look at chapter eight and see how that begins. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons John, ju judges over Israel, okay? And then we learn in chapter 3, in verse 3, that they weren't very good. They accepted bribes, they subverted justice, okay? And at that point, they go to Samuel and they say, we need a king because, you know, your sons are not going to take over from you. And what does he say? Uh, of course, he's very... The idea is that it, it, you know, all we know is the beginning of, of, of verse six that Samuel didn't like this at all. And then God comes to him and says, well, don't worry. OK, obey what they said. Uh, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. OK, so we get from this little interaction that Samuel is not just um, uh, against the idea of a king from an ideological point of view, but there's something here that he's feeling personally insulted over uh, because that's what really God is is addressing. He's saying, you know, it's not you they have rejected, it is me. So from that, we know that Samuel feels rejected. Okay. So here in chapter 12, we're going to hear 
his expression of rejection. Now, when is this happening? Okay, this is happening after Sam, Sam, Samuel's already crowned Saul king three times. But yet he's, there seems to be still this um, remaining sense of rejection. And the fact that he mentions his sons here as if I don't understand the problem. My sons are still here. You know, uh, here I am. Um, my sons are still with you. As if he's completely ignoring the fact that all of this began because the nation said to him, your sons are no good. All right. Which is a little odd here. OK, because you would think that he would recognize the fact that his sons are problematic. But at some point, he really isn't, at least here. So let's continue reading. So first of all, one of the things he's saying, he's kind of skipping from the sons to himself. He doesn't defend his sons, really. He just says they're still here, but he defends himself. And I think in a way, he's I don't know if he's really saying so much, my sons are here as much as he's saying, I'm still with you. I haven't died yet. Yes, I am. Uh, I am old. OK, but I'm still with you. And therefore, he, he is saying you know, you effectively have deposed me by asking for a king. I went along with you by giving you Saul. And indeed, it's God that also goes along, right, and gives him Saul. But it's very important for him today. It's not enough what God had said to him then. They're not against you. They're against me. OK, it's very important for him today to have a declaration on the part of the nation that he himself, Samuel, never wronged them. And this was never an issue. When the nation came to, to ask for a king, they never claimed that Samuel himself was inappropriate. They had claims against his sons, and they were concerned because Samuel was getting old. So it's really not a big deal in the sense that they agree right away. And they responded, you have not defrauded us, you have not robbed us, and you have taken nothing from anyone. He said to them, the Lord then is witness and is anointed as witness to your admission to the state that you have found nothing in my possession. They responded, he is. OK, so there's this kind of interchange here in a way to kind of clear the air. But we clearly see that Samuel is still feeling very uncomfortable with the idea of a king. So until now, uh, in these first few verses, he seems to be addressing more of a personal issue. Is that all this is? Is it just about Samuel is feeling insulted, even though we already have a king, he's still feeling insulted, and he kind of wants to clear the air and clear his name and make sure that really nobody has anything against him. And that's exactly what happens. Nobody has anything against him. But then he goes on, and he goes on here for a very long speech, which we will re read, which kind of goes out throughout the whole history of the nation from the exodus of Egypt up until this very day and talks about their sin, okay, sins that have happened all along and ends with the fact that the very request of a king was a sin. And the way Samuel presents it here, then it is no longer a personal insult. Here, he seems to be presenting it as an ideological, religious, whatever problem. It's not like you have it against me. It's that there's something wrong in your relationship with God. And then perhaps we can better understand if we take that into account, maybe then we can better understand what Samuel is referring to in the beginning of chapter 12, that he's not so much worried about his own personal feelings. He's not so much trying to get reassurance from the nation that they have nothing against him. What he is probably trying to do here is create a situation where he becomes um, an independent uh, person that is talking to them about the, prob the problematic aspects of asking for a king while clearing himself of any possible conflict of interest. Because if he were to start by saying, I'm really upset that you asked for a king and this is a sin, they would have said to him, oh, you know, He's still got this chip on his shoulder. He's still upset. He thinks we're we we are upset with him, and he's just taking it so personally. And so maybe the point of the beginning is to say, no, 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 this is not personal. And he asked the nation to indeed assure him, not because 
he needs that assurance, but because he wants to make sure they really and truly believe that he is not he is not acting here out of conflict of interest because he never wronged them. He really was fine. There's no problem in their relationship. So if there's no problem in their relationship, now he's able to see, okay, you see, no problem in our relationship. I don't have a personal interest here. Now I want to tell you in the context of our history and the context of perhaps how God is seeing this, what is going, what is my concern here? Okay. Uh, okay, so let's continue reading. Samuel said to the people, I'm in verse six, the Lord is witness. He who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. Come stand before the Lord while I cite against you all the kindnesses that the Lord has done to you and your fathers. When Jacob came to Egypt, your fathers cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God. So, we, and we, by the way, we saw similar kinds of speeches like that also in the book of Judges. Okay, we have at the beginning of the book of Judges, we have that angel who comes. We have this recurring theme that, yes, there's, first of all, we saw this pattern throughout the book of Judges where the nation uh, leaves God, they sin, then there's an oppressor, then the God calls out, they call out to God, God brings a salvation. And then rather than realizing at that point, oh, wow, God is our salvation, let's be good. So they're good for a very short time, and then they lapse back into their bad behaviors. And every so often, there's somebody who kind of reminds them of this pattern. So here Samuel is filling in, falling into this position, like we've seen in the past, of somebody showing them the whole pattern, okay? But they forgot the Lord their God. So he delivered them into the hands of Sisera, the military commander of Hatsor, into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the kind of Moab. And these made war upon them. They cried to the Lord, we are guilty, for we have forsaken the Lord and worshiped the Baalim and Ashtarot. Oh, deliver us from our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Yerubal. Yerubal, you'll remember, is Gideon. Okay? He sent Yerubal and Bidan and Jephthah and Samuel. Samuel himself. Okay? Samuel, therefore, as we had said in the past, in many ways, Samuel is the last judge. OK, because he's this leader above Israel before the kings, uh, but he's different than the other judges. OK, but here you can see he clearly sees himself as the last in a series of judges and delivered you from the enemies around you. And you dwelt in security. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was av advancing against you, you said to me, no, we must have a king reigning over us, though the Lord your God is king. OK. He now is describing the demand, or it seems to be at least, that he's describing the demand for a king to the rise or the problem of this king of Ammon. Now, if you recall, if we go back to where did we first heard, hear about Ammon and Nachash, it's in chapter 11. Where did they ask for a king? Chapter 8, okay? And it's... It, it, one of the things that's very interesting is on the one hand, chapter eight, they asked for a king. First of all, what seems to prompt their desire for a king is because Samuel's getting old and his sons are no, are no good. OK, but one of the things that God says when he says, yes, yes, you know, appoint them a king, uh, he says. Um, one second. Oh, I lost where it is. I'll find it. But anyway, what, one of the things when God tells them, yes, you know, they, they ask for a king and they're right and they need a king. At what point God says, yeah, we'll appoint them a king so he can uh, save them from from enemies. Um, I don't exactly see where that is, but I'll whatever. It is there somewhere. I just forgot to write down where it is. OK, so clearly then we have this idea of of a king. Yes, coming to save enemies, but the specific enemy of Nahash, king of Ammon, only shows up um, later on, only shows up in, uh, uh, in, in chapter 11, okay, just the chapter before. So that's all a little odd. Now, you could say that what he's basically saying is not that the problem with Nahash was what caused them to ask for a king. But the problem was Nahash represents one of the underlying reasons for a king. Now, this is one thing to say, Samuel, you're getting old and, and your sons are no good. But what do they need a king for? Okay. 
And this may be the underlying reason that they feel they need a king is to protect them from their enemies, to lead them in battle. Very much like judges, okay? But the judges were, as we saw as the book of Judges deteriorated, the judges were localized solutions, usually uh, to fight battles against a particular enemy at a particular time, and very often only in a particular region. Sometimes the judge ended up being involved only with a few of the tribes, those few tribes that were involved with this particular problem. Um, where, and so it's very possible that, and this is one way to read verse 12, is that Nahash is a recent example. You see Nahash, you just went through this battle of Nahash, king of Ammon, and it's exactly for this kind of thing that you wanted to have a king, someone who would lead you in battle, okay? Which Saul just did, okay? But what does he say afterwards? Uh, and, you, and you said to me, we must have a king reigning over us, though the Lord your God is your king. And this really is the crux of the issue for Samuel. You have an enemy coming. What does he say in the historical uh, verses here? He's saying, all along, you have an enemy. What are you supposed to do when you have an enemy? You're supposed to call out to God. And that God will appoint the leader, the general, or whatever to save you. What's bothering Samuel here is that he's concerned that by having a king, they will no longer call, call out to God. Because the king is a permanent figure, is a centralized figure, okay? He's concerned that from now on, instead of calling out to God to give wisdom, strength, whatever, to a leader, they're going to call out to the leader himself. And this really may be what's underlining, underlying the whole hesitation that Samuel has from the beginning on this whole thing. Let's continue to read. Verse 13. Well, the Lord has set a king over you. Here's the king that you have chosen that you have asked for. So we have the both a combination where Samuel's saying, okay, you wanted the king. And guess what? God agreed. Good for you. You got your king. And God actually appointed him, and it's all set. But now he says, if you will revere the Lord, worship him, and obey him, and will not flout the Lord's command, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God well and good. But if you do not obey the Lord, you will flout the Lord's command. The hand of the Lord will strike you as did your fathers. So first look at this. The, the, at, at first glance, this is a typical kind of thing that we see throughout the Bible. If you follow God's command, he will protect you. If you do not follow the Lord's command, he will strike you. We know that. And, and, and he says, as he did to your fathers, referring back to this, this whole list of, of situations, verse 8 through 12, that he is talking about. But look what it also says here. If both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. And here, I think, we're seeing an additional problem that Samuel has. His first problem is, as I said, are you going to stay loyal to God? Are you going to call out to God? Or are you going to call out to the king? Are you going to forget about God because you say we have a king? We don't need God anymore. But he's also concerned about the king himself. Is this king, as much as he was chosen by God in every way, Yet Samuel is concerned, is this king going to stay loyal to God? Now stand by and see the marvelous thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. It is the season of the wheat harvest. I will pray to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain. Then you will take thought and realize what a wicked thing you did in the sight of the Lord when you asked for a king. Now those of you who are, are, are in the UK, and even some of you who are in the US, you probably are saying, what is the big deal? If in the season of the wheat harvest, you have some rain. Well, I can tell you as someone living in Israel, when is the wheat harvest? The wheat harvest begins typically around the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Shavuot, which typically takes place somewhere in May, late mid-May, late May, sometimes early June, okay? Believe me, there is no rain in Israel from May at April, you'll have a couple showers. Actually, this year in June, we had a few sprinkles, 
that was so weird. It's the kind of thing that you ask yourself, is God trying to tell us something? There is never rain, okay? But here, we're not even talking about a little drizzle. On occasion, it's very unusual. You'll have a morning drizzle, a few drops. Very, very unusual. But what are we talking about here? Look what we say in, in verse 18. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. We're talking about a major storm that never happens in May or June, okay? And what is he? What is his message? Let's go backwards because we didn't finish this. Um, then you will take thought and realize what a wicked thing you did in the sight of the Lord when you asked for a king. Whoa. Well, Samuel is saying it now. It's not just that he is hesitant about this king. He remains steadfast in his anger. And not only that, he's saying God is angry. Well, why is God angry if it's God who said to him, yes, listen to them. They need a king. It's all good. They need a king. Now let's continue. Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. In other words, God went along with what Samuel asked of him, which was in a sense confirming what Samuel said that they indeed had sinned. Uh, the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, intercede for your servants with the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins the wickedness of asking for a king. So here the nation themselves realized that they were wicked. But Samuel said to the people, have no fear. You have indeed done all these wicked things. Do not, however, turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away to follow worthless things which can neither profit nor save, but are worthless. In this case, there's probably, um, this is, I think, a reference to a pagan type of thing. Don't start praying to this, that tree or idol or stone, which can neither profit nor save, but are worthless. Okay, which is always this, always this threat. And this remains a threat to all the biblical period. They seem to be good. And then all of a sudden, they're worshiping a bowel. They seem to be good. Then all of a sudden they're worshiping some tree. Okay. Um, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will never abandon his people, seeing that the Lord undertook to make you his people. Ah, this, by the way, is one of those foundational statements that is one of the most important statements that any of you, when you're hit with replacement theology, read this verse. Because no matter what happens, even if they're going to sin, even if they're going to follow worthless things, there is an absolutely absolute statement here that cannot be modified. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will never abandon his people, seeing that the Lord undertook to make you his people. In other words, at the point at which God, God has, has put forward a whole new way of looking at things, okay? That's really what the Bible represents. It's an invention in the ancient world. Suddenly, we have the idea of one God, not a pagan God. We have a God that operates on the basis of justice, on the basis of rights and obligations, okay? This is not a God who operates on the basis of whim. So much of pagan worship is a question of bribing the God to, to do good things for you. And the assumption being this God doesn't have a, there's no justice there, but if you bribe the God enough and bring him enough sacrifices, then he'll do what you want. Uh, that's totally foreign to the theology of the Bible, not to mention the concept of the one God of the universe and the fact that there's, he is the one who has created the world. And these are the things that are absolutely overarching when it comes to who is God. What has God done? Because he, what did he do? He chose to make the nation of Israel his people, okay? And there's a connection here between, in this verse between making, him, making us his people and the sake of his great name. Because he basically has made us his people in order to give us a job. And our job is supposed to be to spread the message of God. Who is God? Our, our goal is to sanctify his name. So even when we're not doing such a good job of sanctifying his name, if God were to destroy us, that would be the greatest sanctification, uh, the greatest desecration of his name, because it would basically be saying God doesn't know what he's doing. 
God chose his people to bring his word, it becomes like all the pagan gods on a whim. Today, he likes the people of Israel. Tomorrow, he doesn't like the people of Israel. So this is really a very foundational verse, okay? That despite what may be punishments, what may be all kinds of other things that will be problems in the relationship between God and his people, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will never abandon his people. And that is, of course, fundamental. So basically, what Samuel is saying is, you asked for a king for all the wrong reasons. And when we we talked about this, when they asked for a king, what did they say initially? Okay, they started out by talking about why they felt they needed a king. But what did they ask for? And this is chapter 8, verse 5. Therefore, appoint a king for us to govern us like all other nations. And what is Samuel saying here in verse 22? You aren't like other nations. You are God's people. And therefore, when you ask for a king to be like all the other nations, that is where you sinned. And he's concerned as a result of this, that if you're going to follow the way other nations do it, you're going to call out to the king when you have a problem. You're going to forget to call out to God. You're going to obey the king. And if the king leaves God, which is also one of the things he's saying. It's not just you have to obey God. The king has to obey the God. So if the king disobeys God, you follow the king instead of following God, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so I, I think all of this put together, if you step back for a second, and you see what's really going on. I think it becomes clear. Samuel is working, heading over backwards to explain he is not personally insulted by the desire to have a king. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with having a king because, after all, God gave them the king. However, there's a he's worried because they originally came to this idea of the king for the wrong reasons, and he's concerned that this will therefore take them down a wrong path. And you know what? He's 100% right. He's 100% right. But what's so interesting here is that God gives them the opportunity to have a king the way a king should be. Verse 23. As for me, far be it from me to sin against the Lord and refrain from praying for you. And I will continue to instruct you in the practice of what is good and right. Above all, you must revere the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart and consider how grandly he has dealt with you. For if you persist in your wrongdoing, both you and your king will be swept away. What is he saying here? It's not about me, Samuel says. I'm not going to get angry at you. I'm not going to agree with you. I'm not going to disagree with you. My role here is to help you connect better with God. And I will help you repent, he says. Okay? And if you really and seriously, you're not sure how to do something. said, so the king, yes, he's going to be a judge. He's going to be um, a, a, a general. He's going to have political alliances. He does all that king stuff. But what Samuel here is saying very, very clearly, that does not obviate the need for a prophet. That does not obviate the need for a spiritual leader. And that also gives context to how he begins. OK, he begins by saying. Um, and he says in verse seven. Come stand before the Lord while I cite against you all the kindnesses the Lord has done to you and your fathers. I. I'm going to be here as an helping you to understand what it is God expects of you, how God sees your history, and what that means for you to do. I'm going to be able to do this. This is not the job of the king. This is the job of the prophet. And so what he's saying to them also is at the very beginning when he says, I'm still here. Okay? You have asked of me and have set a king over you. Okay? As for me, I have grown old and gray. Here I am. I'm still here. And so I think this is also very much a part of the message at the very end. I'm worried about what you're going to do with this king. I'm worried about all of this. But I'm still here. I'm not going to lead you into battle. But I am here to help you in your relationship with God. And uh, unfortunately, Samuel doesn't live forever. He won't continue to be with them all the time. And that uh, that may be part of the problem. But at the other hand, even with a good prophet, as we see later on, we read later in the Bible, the major prophets in Jeremiah in particular, you see these prophets that are given impossible tasks. God continues to send a prophet to help the people 
be what they should be uh, spiritually and 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 morally. Uh, and yet, it, it, despite the fact that they have kings, the kings are not going to fulfill that role. And God is an amazing kindness that God sends us these people. But unfortunately, we far too often don't listen to them. We don't, don't take advantage of the tools and the guidance that they're giving us to act the way we should act. So that's chapter 12. Any questions or comments? Okay, everybody's smart today. Good. Anyway, one thing now I have to let you know, I will not be teaching for the next two weeks. I am leaving Saturday night for the US. So next Monday and the Monday afterwards, I will be in the US. And whenever I'm traveling, it's impossible for me to do this because usually the internet is very, even if I can free up this particular hour for the, for the, um, for the class, the internet is very often incredibly problematic, so I can't rely on it. So we will not meet for the next two weeks. We will come back and we will make three weeks for today. Um, uh, another thing is that I am going to be, uh, I've written to this to both of, to all of you, I'm sure you know it, but just to remind you, I am going to be stepping down as director of CFYC beginning September 1st. Um, I will be continuing uh, to be involved with CFYC, but from September 1st to October 15th, I am taking a much needed holiday. So I have worked it out so we will get to a very natural stopping point uh, in the book of Samuel. We will basically be finished with um, uh, everything about Saul up until we meet David. And that's when we'll take a break. And then we will reconvene in the middle of October, beginning with David enters the scene, which of course is very influential in how Saul ends up. So this is just an overview to let you know in advance, but of course, every week we will send out a reminder and let you know we have class, we don't have class, whatever. Uh, and, uh, but I will, one of the things that I will continue to do, even though I will no longer be directed, uh, director, I will continue to teach this weekly class, which I absolutely adore. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 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 Enjoy your holiday. It's interesting that it's that the Hofesh means holy day. <laughs> That's right. And it's actually the Jewish holidays all fall in there. I mean, it's not a six week period, but there's a month of Jewish holidays that will be in the September 1st to October 15th. And I'm actually looking forward to being able to prepare for the holidays and enjoy the holidays without having to juggle work. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, instead of coming home for work at eight o'clock and starting to cook till midnight, I can actually cook at one o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to be fun. Anyway, whatever. It's all good. But we will meet next week. I'm in this. I'm in the States for two weeks. Um, we'll send out an email if any of you are in places where I will be. I will be at Kufa if any of you are going to be there in Washington, D.C. on the 16th and 17th and 18th. Um, and other than that, um, that's it. I'll be in touch. Have a great day. And a great thank week. you so thank much. You, thank you very You're much. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. Check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.